going to call the Murfreesboro City Council. It's April 11th, 2024. Um, it's 1130. We're at the Airport Business Center. Um, I'm going to call our meeting to order. Uh, Ms. Brown, I don't think we had anything on actionable items at public comment. Right? Okay. All right. If you'll bow with me, uh, I'll say a prayer and then we'll uh, do our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Father, we thank you for all the things that you've given us, uh, the ability that we have to be here today. I thank you for each member who's sitting here at this table. Um, I thank each staff member and, and employee who's here. Uh, Lord, please continue to bless this city. Uh, continue to, to help us with the decisions that we need to make to make Murfreesboro uh, the best it can be. Uh, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, we have five actionable items. Uh, we have Mr. Tucker, uh, I don't know if you're handling this, or but we uh, care. Karen, come on, we have the opi opioid remediation fund spending plan. Sorry, Karen. Oh, yeah. oh you're good. Hey, I think you. Me I like think that. it was also announced yesterday that you were uh, yeah. awarded. A, a, can you tell us about that? So nothing the, better than to talk about yourself. Right. I know. Right. Well, I, like I'm very appreciative to the city because um, I achieved that because of being able to work with the city and their support of professional development. But in the grant writing industry, there's a certification called grant professional uh, certification, and so it's a, a six-hour test, and so I was able to take that and passed it, and so now I get to put GPC uh, behind my name, so I have initials now. So. <laughs> <laughs> really have initials behind our names, but I can always say that when you get an email with someone's initials, it really makes you think that they're smarter right. than you are. <laughs> so, so everything I'm about to say, you can um, take with more, you know, credence now, right? <laughs> All right. Let me, uh, doesn't make me less nervous to present, though, I'll tell you that. Uh, let me have, all right. So I'm here to uh, present uh, a request uh, for you to approve uh, the opioid remediation uh, spending plan. Uh, and what we would like to do with those funds is to support the co-responder program with uh, the city of Murfreesboro's police department. So just to provide a little bit of background information of why we feel this is an important um, use of these funds. Um, the Murfreesboro Police Department has really been very proactive um, to address the mental health needs of, of in the community and how to effectively respond to that. And they've been doing that since 2017 uh, when they took the lead in the community with uh, doing crisis intervention training for their police officers. Um, and then in 2021, to further that effort, Volunteer Behavioral Health received a grant that um, embedded a uh, mental health uh, clinician into the police uh, department, and that was Heather Nolas. Uh, and immediately, the response was very positive, um, and they sh it, it showed how effective that program was. Um, because of that, then we uh, allocated some ARPA fundings to ex expand that program and add two more uh, co-responders uh, positions into the police department. And the, the program continues to grow um, with other uh, services. Part of that was establishing the homeless outreach team, um, as well as the three co-responders, and a continued effort to do the crisis intervention training. Um, and one of the things that I did hear from the police officers uh, regarding the crisis intervention training, that's an optional training for the officers, but there's been a very positive response uh, in the force, and they're seeing a lot of, of the officers volunteering to go through that training and become crisis intervention training trained, um, which I think speaks volumes um, for the work that our police department is doing in creating positive response methods. Um, so that kind of leads us here today to what we want to do is really um, look at ways that we can help support that program and sustain it. 
And one of the ways that we identified was um, through this opioid remediation fund. So a little bit of, of what the co-responder program looks like and how that interacts. Um, they work jointly um, with the officers and the host team and they're direct right along. So they're assigned an officer and they um, stay with that officer and respond um, to calls um, that could involve uh, mental health or substance use um, issues. And this is just a broad kind of um, data sheet that tells how some of how effective some of the responses have been. I also provided another handout sheet that provides a little bit more detailed information on um, statistics and data related to um, the effective, effectiveness of the program. Um, so, and I think the one of the key factors is. Um, the increase in the volume of calls that they've been responding to. So in 2022, they identified uh, 262 calls, um, and then in 2023, it jumped to 475 calls. Um, so they are seeing a need um, to, to um, respond to increased uh, calls related to mental health crisis. So what we're looking at is um, the financial impact of the program. So to have three responders, which are contracted through volunteer behavioral health, um, they're not employees of the police department that we do it contracted. And one of the reasons that we do that is because of the licensure requirements. So they are licensed uh, mental health providers, and so volunteer behavioral health carries the licensure for them and meets the state um, and federal criteria for, for meeting those standards. Um, so it's, it's better for us to uh, do this through contracted services. And so that looks, the initial cost just for staffing, um, and then we do provide them with bulletproof vest and um, some uniform pieces, and then indirect cost um, uh, or you know, cell phone, office space, those type things as well. But what we're really looking at is how do we support um, having them in with the police department through covering um, their salaries. And right now, um, with the ARPA funding, those we have two positions that will end this year in June. And then um, the Volunteer Behavioral Health has a mental health grant that will end in 2025. So when we were faced with the conversations about what, how are we going to keep this program going because it is so valuable, um, we really wanted to ensure that there were ways that we could do this. and. Um, the reasons for that is because they're, they're just immediately they provide so many benefits. The primary benefits are uh, reducing um, extra responders on scene. Um, they're able to divert uh, individuals and not have them arrested and take them through that process. They can get them into other care services, um, which you know they can put them into treatment. Um, they can provide resources. Um, and then the, the kind of the secondary benefits of this, uh, as I explained before, we're seeing more officers being willing to be CIT, CIT trained because they see the value of that um, as they respond in the community. Um, and also there's kind of been a secondary uh, benefit and a lot of the, re the officers are engaging with the co-responders um, and they feel like they're a safe and trusted space and so it really is improving um, access to wellness services uh, just within the force in general. Um, so that's been a really added benefit as well. Um, and then MPD is being asked about their program from other uh, law enforcement providers in the surrounding community. So we're really kind of serving as a model program for other agencies, um, which is really nice to say that we're being on the forefront of the work that we're doing, and that's really important. So where we're at now, um, we have a need to uh, fund two positions and um, BBH uh, can cover the third position. And what we see this opioid uh, funds allowing us to do is really bridge, bridge the gap. Um, so we're, we're working strategically to look at how we can um, 
create this as a sustainable program uh, into the future. Um, I'm currently working on a grant application that if awarded, it would help cover some costs for three years. Um, and so really identifying this as a short-term solution, but buying us time to really uh, effectively implement this program for the long-term sustainability. Um, so we've got currently 290,000 in funds available to us um, that, that they've awarded. We'll get another um, annual distribution. Uh, it's approximately 23,000, give or take, um, uh, through 2038. Um, so that's, we, we really kind of want to use that as, as the seed money um, to help support this program. So um, with that, um, I can turn it over for questions of myself. Um, we've got some of the host officers and um, our co-responder, Olivia, is here as well. And so we welcome any, any questions or comments or anything that we can provide to help, help with this. I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, I think it's an excellent program. Well needed. We're way behind on this. Yes. Uh, this is probably irrelevant, but what are tactical pants? What kind of pants are those? The one with the pockets and cargo pants. Cargo pants. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia can model the full the full uniform, so, so we, we definitely want them to, to be prepared. And Thank you for modeling for me. Uh, I know that you said 49% of the calls result in admission. Wow. That shows you how the program is really needed. That's a large number. So it's really helping... Um, divert individuals from remaining on the street or remaining um, in problematic areas and really getting them into the treatment um, and the services that they need, um, which helps reduce some of the recidivism and response um, uh, for services and repeated calls. Um, I think prior to the, the co-responder programs, I would imagine that they were being called repeatedly to same situations or same scenarios, and so this has really effectively helped reduce some of those re repeat calls. And then, last question, of those 49%, are they majority of children, are they more men, more women? Um, I think it's majority adults um, that they currently work with, and I would say that the majority of them are males. I'm glad to see a female on that task. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Any questions for Karen? Do we need a motion on this? So moved. Second. Motion. Second. Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Jacklett. Aye. Ms. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mr. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We'll move to the Burnt Knob Manson Blackman <clears throat> Intersection Professional Services Agreement. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Griffith. Thank you, Mayor, um, members of the Council. Uh, staff has been uh, monitoring the uh, uh, the continued growth on the west side of I-24 and the um, uh, con con proposed construction of the uh, new elementary school near the intersection of Baker Road and, and Blackman Road. Um, we'll get some. Uh, uh, some conceptual plans if you so if we're if we're looking out in in kind of the north northern section of the blackman area uh this is the uh, the intersection in question there at burnt knob blackman and manson pike the proposed elementary school which is currently under construction by the county is is the darker uh here just to the north of that and then there's also a proposed middle school a little bit further to the north uh, and it's actually uh, those schools are being built at the intersection of baker and and blackman road so we've kind of been looking at it uh we received a 
a traffic impact study from the county school board in February that said that basically uh, this intersection here at Manson Pike and Burnt Knob uh, and Blackman was going to be um, uh, failing uh, up, upwards 10 plus minutes whenever both schools are, are, are actually constructed. So with that in mind, um, We've been working with the county. We've recommended, we've asked the county to uh, to address the um, and to extend their projects. They're, they're doing some improvements to Baker and some improvements to Blackman. We've asked them to add the intersection here at Baker uh, to their improvements. We had about six and a half minute delays uh, shown at this intersection. And then in turn, that we'll drop back and, and start our project at the, uh, at the Burnt Knob Manson Pike intersection. With that in mind, we've uh, re we, we requested a proposal from Kimley Horn for preliminary and final design to widen the intersection. Uh, the project will include uh, constructing additional through and turn lanes at each approach, and it would also include signalizing the, the intersection. Uh, Kimley Horn's proposal for this is $413,500, and that would be funded from reallocated FY21 CIP loans. Uh, mainly from Butler Drive, which is currently running under budget. With that, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer any questions. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Please call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Chris, thank you and the entire team on your hard work on, on this. Thank you. All right, we have the Siegel Park Playground Replacements. Mayor, Council, thank you for the opportunity to present this today. <clears throat> this is source well cooperative contract with the landscape structures and the CIP funds reallocation request for the playground equipment at Siegel Park. Playground was constructed in 2005 and has outlived its usefulness to the city. The proposed agreement has been reviewed by the city's purchasing and legal teams. The expense, 270142 is funded by the fiscal year 21 and 22 Siegel Park CIP budget, including a reallocation of $330,000 from the fiscal years 21 and 22 Barfield Crescent Playground Ball Field Improvements budget. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. <coughs> So moved. Second. Motion to second, please call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to the development agreement with Rutherford County for transfer station. Mayor Council, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present this to you today. Um, you just give me a second here. I, I downloaded an exhibit that I think will. Picture here of the what I'm about to present. If it will come up. Difficulties. I will go ahead and, and maybe it'll load as a as I talk. The uh, this is an agreement that we've kind of been in. Uh, I guess it's a, a, an agreement that we've been developing since really December of last year, in conjunction with the city's with the county's proposed transfer station on their uh, uh, landfill. Sorry, this just doesn't look like. Maybe it's better to do Google Earth here. Earth. Google, how about Google Maps? All right. 
This is the area we're looking at, the old county landfill. They're proposing a transfer station. I believe that's around 25 to 30,000 square feet. They've got a thousand square foot office building and a 500 square foot scale house that is proposed. They had issue. They, they needed sewer, so we actually have a small sewage pump station. This is the uh, uh, Murfreesboro's water plant. So they would have to uh, put a pump station, a small pump station, in to serve these three facilities, get it underneath the river and into our. Uh, sanitary sewer pump station, which we then would take down uh, uh, Sam Jerry Drive all the way down to Compton Road. And they also had issues with getting uh, water from CUD for fire, for, for fire protection from Jefferson Pike. You can see this was a significant uh, distance away from Jefferson Pike, so it was going to take you know, a couple of miles of water line, and I think there were some potential easement issues involving landfill road and whether or not utilities were allowed into that, that road right away. So we, again, we, we've tapped into our uh, yard piping at our water plant to provide an eight-inch water supply line to give them fire protection and uh, drinking water. So that's what this agreement um, lays out, that they would... Uh, as, you, as we did back in, I guess, January of 24, we, we now allow the county and the county schools to not uh, annex or request annexation for outside city sewer service. So they, they did not have to go through that request for annexation. So the development agreement was put together uh, that is pretty much the same development agreement that we, we give every uh, development outside that requests outside city sewer. And uh, we would, uh, I think they passed it recently at their public works meeting and full county commission. So we would request your approval to provide the sewer and the water service uh, to their landfill facilities. I'm available for any questions if you have them. No changes to the development agreement? No, sir. They, they did, as, as we, you, you, you know, they, they tried to carve out some, some terms and conditions that we found unacceptable. Uh, probably why it took such why it took four months to pull, pull this together. Uh, but any other facility that's ever built out there, they've got to come to us and request permission to tie to our sewer service. They can't, they can't, they don't have carte blanche uh, capability to tie into our sewer system. There were a little bit of language from Liz Massage. They wanted to be able to um, develop some additional things out there. And, and we acknowledge that that would be the case, but then you need to come back to us and make sure that it's copacetic with the system before they before they did that. Okay. But they asked for that. It was innocuous. We did it. Any questions? So moved. Second. Motion is second. Please call the roll. <clears throat> Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Chocolate. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Hi. All right. Development agreement with the county for the Plainview Public Safety Building. Yes, sir. Thank you again, Mayor and Council. This is another de uh, development agreement that we're going to request the county execute in order to receive sanitary sewer service. They have um, they've not seen this yet. I don't believe. I don't think we've sent them a copy. <coughs> we're bringing it to you. They already. This is the Plainview Elementary School off of uh, Sledge Road south of Buchanan, way, way, way outside of the city limits. Uh, we did provide sanitary sewer to this elementary school, which you see here to the south. Uh, they do have a proposed middle school, which is not built yet. But if you can see up here in this upper corner, I'll try to little blow that up. This is a uh, public health and safety building similar to what they have built at Rockvale and at Walter Hill. And they're wanting to tie this new facility or this new building into the existing sewer service for the Plainview Elementary. So just to document that that this went through the proper process, that you all saw it, that the county uh, agrees to the development agreement that we put in front of them, we thought it uh, uh, best to to bring this forward to you and ask for your approval on the development agreement with the county. for questions uh, with this as well. And this is the same agreement as the others that we've had? Yes, this one actually is actually almost like a, a, a as though we were sending this straight to a developer. Okay. With no comments, I move for approval. We, we provide the sewer for the other public safety buildings? Yes, sir, we do. 
Okay. We, we, we thought since they're not, if they were creating a separate tract of record, that would change things a little bit. But since it's really, uh, they're not carving out any new parcel, we felt like it was, um, uh, it, it met the, st the conditions of our standard uh, development agreement. But just to clarify, not all their public safety buildings. Really the only one I think we've provided Rockville. sewer to is Rockville. I think we did Wal Walter Hill as well. Yeah, yeah. Wal yeah. Wal Walter, yeah, so we've not Okay, there's others, and I didn't know there was yeah, others. Yeah, Reedville and... and okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha, okay. Well, yeah, passes. yeah. we don't do, we don't okay. provide for those. I just want to make sure that okay. people didn't think we were trying to go out and annex last cases. <laughs> no, <I didn't. laughs> it's just me not knowing how many of these facilities are out there. I mean, we can talk about it, but... <laughs> right. I'm just, just, that's a kidding. Scott Broden, that was a joke. <laughs> Uh, all right. Any questions? You said so moved. Oh, Matt. Yeah, that's, oh. that's right. We've got a motion. We need a second. Second. Motion a second. Mr. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Shackett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. 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 All right. You have the minutes for the October 20th through the November 3rd, 2022 meeting. Are there any additions or deletions to the minutes? If right. there are none, I move for approval. Second. second. Motion a second. You've also got the, oh, sorry, Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Aye. You also have a list of CIP transfers. Do you have any questions for Ms. Brown? Mm -hmm. All right. Seeing none, we'll move to the February dashboard. Any questions for Ms. Tucker? All right. Um, Ms. Brown, do we have any beer permits? We have a regular permit for an ownership change for a grocery market located at 760 East Northfield Boulevard. The applicant has met requirements for the permit and is recommended for approval pending final building and codes inspections. <coughs> March the second, please call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Mr. Chocolate. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Aye. Any statements to be paid? No, sir. All right, we have a couple of other business items. You have the community investment programs, program funds reallocation. Ms. Tucker. Thank you. We have a CIP reallocation to transfer $10,000 from the transportation facility listed in the county shared bonds for schools to a final closeout for overall Creek Elementary. Uh, this payment was withheld until the builder, my understanding is until the builder corrected a construction issue at that school, and that's now resolved. So we recommend this for approval. I'm happy to answer any questions. So moved. Second. Motion second. Please call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right. The other business you have in front of you, amendment of employment agreement for the city manager. Um, this is an amendment for the employment agreement that, you know, Craig, I look, you've been with us for a little over six years now, yeah. almost six years. City manager. Yeah, city manager. That, yeah. So. And so Craig, over the last couple of years, has has talked about when it was time for Craig to transition. And so Craig uh, talked back in February about a possible role change to really, it's in the background here, to step away from the day-to-day -day responsibilities. But also seeing that you know there are other opportunities that we have inside the city, solid waste being a large one, sports authority that we voted on last Thursday. There's all kinds of different things. There's an agreement for Craig at the end of this budget cycle to transition to special counsel and handle those specific roles that are detailed in that agreement. Um, one of the discussions really had to make sure that we don't transition into having a de facto city, another city attorney department or city manager department. So this has been a lot of discussion with Adam um, where where Craig can can help and transition. And so you've got that in front of you if there's any questions. So moved. Okay. Any discussion? Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Gales Harris. Aye. Mr. <coughs> Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right. I've got something I want to pass out. 
passed down. Jennifer, I've got one for the record here, but uh, I'm going to pass that to Adam and to Craig. This is a really rough timeline of talking with... Um, we had a meeting ran off on, I forget what day it was. All, all the days ran together now. Um, you know, council members, we've talked about this, I think not only publicly, but how important I think it is inside our organization to make sure that it's important that people who work here know that they have the opportunity for upward mobility when they're showing loyalty to the sit to our city. Not only that, that it it gives the ability that our executive team and, and everyone who works here at the city knows that they've got the opportunity to be upwardly mobile in our city and that we're training the next leaders of our of our city. So what I'd like to recommend is um, that we look as an internal search for our next city manager and give people who are inside the city the opportunity to apply. Um, so what I'm recommending or what for the entire council, and this is just for a discussion point, that April 15th to April 30th, that we would have internal applications submitted to our employee um, services department. They would populate those together, get those out to the city council, and then May 1st through May 17th that the city council would conduct interviews and also the executive team um, that's together would internally conduct an interview session that we could get feedback from that team who works with the city manager daily. Um, I think it's important to get that feedback from that team. We would get that back on May 22nd through May 30th from employee services and then we would have our public meeting sometime between the 22nd and the 30th to be able to make a selection if we feel like that that internal applicant is there. Um, and and the, the process I'm thinking there is that that gives almost the entire month of June for that internal applicant to be able to finish up the budget cycle with uh, Craig. And, you know, I think one of Craig's strengths by far is the budget process and so it would be good for that individual to get that um, that insight and then july the second is when if we have an internal candidate that they would officially take the role as city manager if the council decides that after we go through the interview process that that candidate is not there then we would go through very similar to what we did several, several, several years ago of, of looking to the outside and going through an external search firm and employee services would, would handle that. Handle that. So that's up for discussion. That's what I just put on paper for everyone to have an idea if that is a reasonable timeline. That gives us really 60 days from, a little over 60 days from now to be able to, to have that, that internal discussion. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable timeline to see if an internal candidate is the best choice. I think it's reasonable. Uh, just a note, I'll be out of the country May 19th through the 28th. I kind of thought we won't be meeting. Sure. But well, that typically means that you may end up being a city manager when you... <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> so in other words, I won't be here the 23rd, but I will be here May 30th. Okay. Yeah. Well, we may can just yeah. you know, figure out what that time... I think May 30th is a Friday, so the 29th is a... Well, we can figure out. If we need to adjust this, I think it's important that every council member is here to make that to make that decision. So. Thirtieth and Thursday. Okay. Okay. So the thirtieth is it? All right. Thursday. If that's the date we want to target. I don't think we said it when we approved the new contract with the city manager, but the effective date for that transition is July the first. July second. July second. Wow. I believe it is. In the contract, it says effective date of the amendment, July 1st. That's the amendment. But okay, yeah, the amendment. Contract. I, so the new city manager would take effect, I think, July the 2nd. Okay. It would take the next day, but we can... There's, there's flexibility yeah. in there. Okay. Right. I'm not... I was trying to think as far as the... First or second. We wouldn't have two city manager salaries at 
you know, we wouldn't have two city manager salaries at the same time. And just for clarity, the executive team is who? Craig? The executive team? Mm -hmm. But who, what individuals are we talking when we say executive team is who? Executive directors. Executive maybe directors. 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 Well, yeah. The, finance director. Yeah. Uh, city, attorney. city attorney, finance director. Uh, um, <laughs> you're going to put me to test. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just thought, about I just thought when you said that. Uh, city staff. Uh, city staff. <laughs> yeah. Ask Austin. He knows. Staff would get involved in this somehow. <laughs> So Raymond, uh, the Chiefs, both All Chiefs, Chiefs. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Nate, um, who am I missing? I'm going to miss Bruce somebody. Nate, Chris, me, Greg, me, Nate. Yeah, the assistant city managers. Okay. And so anybody you can think of. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I just want to give you a list. That's the executive team, yeah. So, yes, so Madeline had a good question about what, what will they be doing. You know, we, when we did the external search um, years ago, we had an internal portion of the city that, that did an interview as well. And so what my thought was on this bill, that it, we went it, years ago, I think we had 24 department heads, and we sort of, one of the things Craig changed is we went more to an executive director team because it was so hard for a city manager to manage 20-some-odd department heads. Mm -hmm. So now I think that's about a number of seven or eight. Does that sound right? Yeah. Um. Yes, and, and the executive team meets on a regular basis. About three or four months ago, I think Darren really put together, and they've been meeting on a regular basis. So they have pretty streamlined them. Who needs to be there? Um, and you know, I didn't I didn't name HR, but obviously as we go through the process, that Randolph would be and his team would be involved. Are, are we seeing this those interviews to be individual interviews or a collective? Because more than likely there could be some. Yeah, applicants from the executive team. Absolutely. Yeah, I think what would, what I would see, if the council, and of course this is just for debate, the executive director interviews would be together, um, and you know really more. The employee services has got a very detailed list of questions to ask, but I would think that this internal candidate would need to come in and talk about. What's their plan and their vision for the city? You know, um, but then from our standpoint, I've really gone back and forth on individual interviews. I, I'm not sure individual works. I think we almost just have to you know, do what we did with the, um, with the last city manager search was we really did that in the public. And... I'm not sure we'd, if we did that in the administrative conference room and made that open for it. You know, it has to be an open meeting. Or if we do that in council chambers, that, that's a little very formal. <coughs> at some point, we're going to have to have that discussion in the council chambers. But maybe it's here that, you know, the individual gets up and we ask questions. And that way the community can, the community can also take part and see that, that process. Well, plus, a, you know, I think sometimes the collective questioning helps us. Yeah understand a little bit more a question we might not have thought of by ourselves might come up by someone else and, and so, to hear that response. But the other part too, I don't want to preclude that if 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 a council member wants to sit down individually with one of those applicants or the internal, I think that would be beneficial to be able to ask those questions. So But the council will be involved in all interviews, even the executive we would not be the council would not be in the executive um, bring us a report. The, the, they would come back with a, I think, a summary of both, and that this would be through employee services, a summary of both, like we would do with any. So they're going to come to us with their recommendation. Not a recommendation. I don't think we would want them recommending an applicant. I think we would want them to come back with a rating on here's where this applicant scored in this area, and just like we would do. Adam, you may want to go into this, how we handle some of our other hires. Well, I mean, this sounds very similar to what my interview process was for city attorney, was that there were five or six, we didn't have executive directors then, but it was assistant city manager and HR director and um, a couple other department heads, did a very structured interview with structured initial questions and then had follow-up follow questions based on my answers. 
And my understanding, not having seen inside the black box because I was a candidate, but my understanding was that there was some evaluation document that came back to council as to how the various candidates ranked in certain areas or what they thought of the responses to the specific questions. And that was used to inform council this decision, but it was not it was not a recommendation. Right. Why would maybe I'm hearing wrong. Why would we conduct two different interviews? Like if Austin was one of the candidates, the executive council interviews him and then we interview him. Why would we have two interviews just for more information, I mean, there, there is kind of a different perspective from council than there is from organizational staff. And kind of combining those two together so that council makes a real, a, a real good decision with all that information. Historically, when I've interviewed candidates, the more eyes you can get on them, the better it is. Paired setting, somebody's asking the question, somebody's listening. I'm going to pick up things just by listening to your question to them that I've would normally not catch if I'm sitting here asking the question right now. I understand I, I, that. I like with the council interviews with his have many an option to sit in on these executive. I also. don't, Madam. I, I think we need to be careful. If more than one council member sits in in those meetings, then it's a public meeting. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think we would want. Their questions that they're going to ask on an operational standpoint are going to be way different, I think, than the questions that the council members are going to so ask. So we're going to have an interview separate from them? Yeah, we would have our, the council would do an interview with the candidates, and then the executive team would do an interview with the candidates. We would use the same rating scale uh, right. that, that employee services would have. We would, you know, individually when we... When we interview, we're going to have a rating scale that we will figure out that will all come together as, as well. Um, and I guess my next question is, how much will we be led by the executive ratings? Let's say their ratings, let's say of me, the executive group, they have me on a scale from 1 to 10, they'll come back with an 8. And then the council, not knowing yet what their rating is, we come back with a 6. Well, I do think we? the staff will do first, and then the added right. information will go to council. So you'll have what staff before you do your your assessment evaluation. And, okay. and you may not agree with what staff. So you may be on the totally different page. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. This is this That's is your hire. Yeah. The yeah. council is on a different. Right. Yeah. Still our decision. Right. 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 We They're make just going to give us yeah. input. And who is on that executive one more time? Well, and, and, and Bill raised a good point. I mean, obviously the applicants would not be in there, but but it would be our executive directors, which are the chiefs, um, Adam, Jennifer, um, uh, Raymond, Nate, Angela, uh, Chris, Greg. Who am I, I, just, I, just, I just sent, I just emailed everybody. Oh, okay. Who's on those monthly meetings. Oh, thank you. There you go. I'm clear Staff on that. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, Adam, so I just want to say this Adam, Angela, Chris Griffith, Aaron Tucker, Greg McKnight, Jennifer Brown, Mark McCluskey, Michael Bowen, Nate Williams, Randolph Wil Wilkerson, Raymond Hillis, Sam Huddleston, and Darren Gore. I mean, I, that's a pretty good cross section of the, of the, of the city. Yeah, they, they all have. I'm just like Austin. I didn't know who was on the executive board, period. I mean, no, I know. Yeah. A new staff. A new staff. <laughs> Another title. Right. Executive team staff. But we need the council. To, if the council's okay, I have full faith in Randolph and his team. They handle interviews a whole lot more than we handle those. Yeah. So it would be good to let them put that process together. This is just a a, a timeline that we would like to hit. But I'm sure Randolph, they will come up with a very formal process on, on how that will work and then how that information will be transmitted back to the city council for us to make our, our ultimate recommendation or, or us to vote on who we want to be that, that leader. Um, and I hope we have that person here inside the city. If we don't, then we need to be prepared. And I'm sure Randolph and his team will, will be preparing behind the scenes on 
you know what that next step is if that if that person is is not here yeah, i hope that too because the last time when we went outside we had a consultant we paid sixty five thousand too they brought back the candidates and we didn't agree on any of them so to me that was a waste of money well yeah you, i mean you don't it's not the consultant's fault. <laughs> I was going to apply, but, but what I'm saying is, we, we had a very. That, I think they brought us five people back yeah. in the council. Yeah, we had people from Oregon, and yeah. we had. I mean, we had people from. One person was from Alaska that applied. Yeah. I mean, we had people from all over the. But but the process that we're talking about here, there's there's lots of different ways to go about this. But the process we're talking is not unusual. Um, right. Lots of places go about it in kind of this fashion. So, so Randolph will put together a good. A good process, I think. Does everyone, does everyone, I mean, I think in, in hearing from Madeline too, we don't want to hire someone from the outside, an outside firm to manage an internal process. And I think everybody agrees our, our employee resources group can handle that. So, but are y'all okay with just this overall timeline and then we can get Randolph and his team to come back with a more defined process? I'm good. I'm good with it. Okay. It's going to be some extra meetings for us over the next next 60 days. I, I, you know, the way we did it last time was we all interviewed. We had our questions that we wanted to ask, and then once those interviews were done, then we had another meeting to really go through and talk about all those different things. So, and how that process, and then typically. Once you select someone, then that will take another week or two with employee resources and the legal department to work on all the behind the scenes stuff that needs to be done. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, a detailed process. All right, Randolph, we'll, we'll give you a copy of this and then let you make sure and, and brief counsel on exactly the next steps. So. Uh, Craig, I, I don't think we can. Oh, sorry. Some, anybody else have other business? I do. Bill. Uh, all of our boards and commissions do an exceptional work that we couldn't accomplish without the people that serve on these boards and commissions. But as you all know, I, I serve as the liaison with the school board. And the other night at a workshop, which went for about three hours, and we've got another three hour session of, of budget review. Uh, this group does an exceptional job, yeoman's work, and I don't think that their compensation has been even considered or dealt with uh, as long as I've been, well, even 2002 when I was first on council. Uh, we ever uh, considered uh, increasing their compensation for the amount of work that they do. Uh, so uh, I think this is one of the positions that is uh, under ordinance for its compensation. So it would require Adam to do a little work to kind of come up with something. Uh, which which group, Bill? The school board, city school board. So the school board members. The school mm -hmm. board members, okay. right, yeah. And I believe the compensation is paid out of their budget, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's paid out of their budget. So as far as implication on our general budget is not is not significant. But uh, I would like to ask that uh, Adam uh, prepare us a document that would uh, uh, consider the uh, compensation for our uh, city school board members. What, what's their compensation now? Is it three, it's three hundred. Uh, for for no, for the first meeting is right. three hundred, and then I think one hundred and fifty. Yeah, I think for the second. second but if they have additional that, more than that, they don't get any. I don't think they get anything for this. Yeah, that, right. And then the discussion I think was, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's at a, another hundred dollars. Yeah, in there. It's, it's not in a major that. jump. It's so just it's not a major no. increase, but. What's yeah. the, what would be the, uh, the total impact? Like eight thousand dollars? Yeah, if you do the math, it's like eighty-seven hundred bucks. Okay. Pretty, pretty insignificant. But we will because it's established that compensation is established under the, uh, under an ordinance. It would have to be drafting an ordinance that would that we would vote on. So three fifty the first meeting, and then three hundred, I think. Is it three hundred or three fifty? Well, I'd have to pull the statute up now, but I think it's generally three hundred to three hundred. One hundred fifty. The second meeting. The hundred fifty. One hundred fifty. Then after that, nothing. 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 Okay. The, the thing to go with that as well is there's been so many 
state requirements and changes in the edu yeah. education that has required them to meet so much more that, um, and, and Bill sees it firsthand. Well, they're constantly going you. to trainings. Each the school board, uh, you have to have certain qualifications and trainings that they go to regularly. Uh, an annual meeting of school boards that they all go to. Uh, it is it is remarkable the kind of service that we get out with folks, and for the most part, it's volunteer. I mean, basically, when you're talking about those kind of dollars, it's a volunteer. Position. And it's not. This is not even Bill. I mean, clearly, with the amount that they're getting paid, it's not a, pro a deal. You're, it's, not about you're, money. it's not about the money, it's but you, you also want to want to be able that it doesn't cost them exactly to serve. So I, it seems a very fair. It's, it's a reasonable request that we've considered this. So. If it's not about the money, throw us in it. <laughs> well, uh, I think we can all evaluate that ourselves. <laughs> so, but it, I guess what I'm asking is that the council would uh, give. Adam, the direction to uh, come up with an ordinance to address this. That sounds good. Um, a quick, just quick question, um, as I'm going to be the one drafting this ordinance. Um, how many times typically do they meet twice a month? Yeah, it's every other week, yeah. Every other week, and that's the same case in the... In the Except during budget time, because like I say, we will meet probably four... At least four times this this month. I'm, I'm Adam, would you for a meeting? But they also have educational requirements. So if they go to that, probably. Adam, maybe be. maybe it would be good if you wouldn't mind getting with Trey, Trey. Trey. and I think Trey. Wesley Ballard was the one who, who Wesley, brought this up. Wesley, like, maybe get an idea before you bring something back to us exactly what that is, and that would help us yeah. understand. Yeah. It, you yeah. know, wondering whether meeting basis or some other structure yeah. makes yeah. the most sense. Well, let's look at the existing ordinance and see what, you know, because I'm kind of, it doesn't seem reasonable to me that one meeting is worth $300 and the next meeting is worth $150. I mean, I mean, or, uh, it, that doesn't make sense, so I would think if... Uh, yeah, council's paid per... Well, it, but it just doesn't seem... Because let me tell you, that second meeting sometimes could be a four-hour meeting, and the first meeting was an hour meeting. It's like with us. I mean, you know, you get the best on that first meeting, but after that, it just, <laughs> just goes down from there. So. All right. Hey, before does, does council members have any other business? Well, yeah. uh, Craig, I want to say this before, with the discussions that we we just had. You know, over the last twenty years, I've had the opportunity to work with four different city managers, and it's easy to armchair quarterback. And the one tough thing, well, the multiple things that are tough, but the toughest is you've got seven different bosses. And that's that's hard for anyone. That's hard for Adam. That that is a tough job. But I, I just want to publicly say it's easy to second guess, and there are decisions I'm, I'm sure that you would go back and say I would do different now if I knew. In hindsight, I mean that's just part of being a leader. You you evaluate. But I've not worked with a city manager as detailed and strategic as as you are, and I can't think that the city would be operationally where we are and financially where we are. I mean, this city is in the best financial shape that we have ever been in, and a lot of that goes to you and the team that you've put together. So I just want to say thank you for the hard work. You're still here for a while. Yeah. But, um, yeah. it, you know, it, I don't want to go through of us talking about who your replacement is without talking about the work that you've done to this point. No, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the opportunity to serve and to continue to serve. Uh, but... I will say the accolades really belong to staff uh, over the last few years. We have city has an excellent staff. Going internal, I think, is very smart. Uh, there are excellent people here, and, and the accomplishments over the last several years really belong to our staff. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Council, we have any other thing else? All right, uh, will we have a meeting next Thursday? Uh, yes, we will. Okay. Have a meeting. All right. yep. I will not be here next week. Okay. Well, then you may end up being city manager <laughs> next week. Jamie's <laughs> <laughs> back. So. Just okay. reminder that that on um, that on the 18th at uh, 11 o'clock is it or uh, the uh, yeah, dedication of the yes, yeah. so Thursday the 18th 11 o'clock is the dedication on Oakland Court. <laughs> <laughs>
Not today. Not today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hey, not today. All right. If there's no other business, we'll stand adjourned.